morning is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. Listen to what it says. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This rich text from 1 Peter, it speaks of the identity of God's people, the church. From this text, we see what it means to be part of Christ's church. And then Peter encourages the church to live out its God-given identity. And finally, the church is sent out to make a difference in the world. Uh, Before we unpack the text, for just a few moments, I want you to think about your favorite famous person. Maybe it's an athlete, Patrick Mahomes or Serena Williams. Maybe it's an actor or actress, uh, Sandra Bullock, or uh, maybe a musician, uh, Kanye West. Or maybe it's a speaker, uh, a preacher, Chuck Swindoll or Beth Moore. I want you to think of that person for a moment, that famous person. Can you imagine how difficult it must be for famous people to live an ordinary life? I mean, you're in the public eye. People feel like they know you, but you don't know them. Take, for example, newscasters. Even in our small town of Joplin, thousands of people see them on television every night, and they get to know them. In fact, they think they know them because they see them so often, and people begin to identify with them. And yet, the famous person doesn't know them. The audience thinks they know who that person is, but actually the audience are strangers to the famous person. Uh, There's a story that's told about the American playwright, Arthur Miller, who sitting alone in a restaurant was approached by a well-dressed man who had the appearance of success. And and the man went up to Arthur Miller and said, aren't you Arthur Miller? Uh, Why, yes, I am. Uh, Do you remember me? The man said. Miller paused and he looked at the man and he replied, actually, you do look familiar. And the man said, well, Art, I'm your old buddy, Sam. We went to high school together. In fact, in high school, we went out on double dates together. Uh, You may not have recognized me because I've done all right. I manage department stores here in the area. In fact, Art, what do you do these days? And Art hesitated a moment and then he responded, well, I write. The man asked, what is it that you write? And Miller said, plays mostly. And curious, the man asked, have you written any plays that have ever been produced? And humbly, Art replied, well, yes, some. And the man grew more curious. And he asked, would I know any of these plays? Well, perhaps. Have you heard of Death of a Salesman? And Sam's jaw dropped. His face went white. For a moment, he was speechless. And then he cried out, Why, you're Arthur Miller! Sam recognized his high school friend, Arthur Miller. And he was familiar with the dramatist, Arthur Miller. But Sam didn't realize that the two were one and the same. Here's my point. There is a sense in which this happens in our experience as Christians. We know ourselves and we know each other in a superficial way, but we do not grasp who we are at the core of our being. Like a man who has forgotten his name, we can wander about the streets of life without knowing our true identity. Well, life in the presence of God is intended to give shape to our identity. Do you know who you are, Christian? That is the question that the writer of 1 Peter is addressing. In fact, notice how he opens the text again in verse 9. But you are, he says. Do you get that statement? This is a statement of identity. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. 1 Peter was written to Christians in small house churches in Asia Minor. The Christians in these churches were a minority in the Greco-Roman culture. 
Where they lived, Christianity was an unwelcome, despised foreign religion. Now, by becoming a Christian, they had suffered rejection and alienation from their family, their friends, and from society as a whole. In fact, to be labeled Christian made, more, made life more difficult, if not dangerous. The Christians at the time that Peter is writing were alienated socially, politically, and economically. In fact, even Peter refers to them as strangers and exiles in their own land. Because of their faith, these Christians suffered as nobodies. So the, author, so the author of 1 Peter writes to the church to remind them that they did have a place in the world. In Christ, he said, you are God's people. You belong to God. You are part of a new community with a new purpose, with a new identity. The writer, in effect, says this, do you know who you are, church? And he sums up his answer to that question in one magnificent sentence. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. These are powerful words of identity, powerful words of belonging. We, Blenville, need to be reminded of who we are. Being the church in our own day is not easy. And we have great challenges ahead of us as the church that is marginalized in our current culture. Uh, Dan Kimball, in his book, They Like Jesus But Not the Church, he explains that his re what his research has found after studying the emerging generation of young adults who are aged 30 to 45. Kimball says this, and other stu studies have actually confirmed his conclusions. He writes that the majority of these adults are open to talking about Jesus. They're open to talking about spirituality, but they are not interested in the church. Their perceptions of organized religion are not positive. They describe themselves as spiritual, but not religious, and they are absent or disappearing from the church in large numbers. In fact, if you look at our congregation here at Blendville, the age group that is, most, that is missing the most is those who are in the age of 35 to 45. And listen to what one of these young adults said that talked to Dan Kimball. She said, and her name is Alicia, and she is a molecular biologist. And she said this, why do I need the church? It isn't necessary. I have a relationship with God and I pray a lot. But I don't see the point of having, having to add all these organized rules like the church leaders think you should do. It feels like they take something beautiful and natural and they make it into this complex, non-organic structure where you now have to jump through hoops and do everything in the way the organized church tells you to. It seems to lose all of its innocence when it becomes so structured and so controlled. Something to think about. As our culture grows increasingly secular and post-Christian, hostile to the values of Christianity, more people around us are becoming indifferent to the church here in America. In the face of all this, it is easy for those of us committed to the church to become discouraged, to feel out of place, to feel alienated from the culture around us, just like the original readers of 1 Peter. As a church, we can feel like dinosaurs in a high-tech world. That's why we need to hear the words of 1 Peter as words that are spoken to us as well. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called you out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Doesn't that have a ringing of relevance to us today? In fact, the language and metaphors that Peter uses are ancient. They are four titles of honor and dignity taken right out of the Old Testament. 
The images that Peter uses comes from Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, and from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 20 to 21. To those struggling Christians, alienated from friends, family, and society, without an identity, the writer of 1 Peter proclaims, you are somebody, church. And those words also speak to us as we're struggling to understand who we are and what it means to be the church in our day and time. Peter is telling us, Blenville, you are somebody. Blenville, you are like a chosen race, the people of God, precious and beloved of God. You are like royal priesthood. Priests and ministers of God, your king, called to minister to one another and to the world around you. Blenville, you are the family of God who belong to the household of God. That's who we are. We are a holy nation. We are a holy people as the church, special and set apart for God's purposes. Blenville, the church, the church is God's people called to make a difference in the world. Now, here's the important thing to understand about this identity. If we have this identity, it also comes with a responsibility. It comes with a task. Look at verse 9. To proclaim the mighty acts of God who called you out of the darkness of this world into the hope and healing of God's marvelous light. Well, what's Peter calling us to? He's saying that we are called to use our lives, to use our actions, to share with others God's grace and mercy. So 1 Peter is asking us, do you know who you are? If you do, there is every reason to be hopeful. Now, in 2020, this is a wonderful opportunity for the church to rediscover its voice. This is an opportunity for the church to reinvent itself and its ways of being in the world. Now is the time to discover new ways to reach out to people who have either never stepped foot in the church or who walked out one Sunday to never return. As the church, we are to meet them where they are and we're to walk with them and we're to welcome them into the marvelous, marvelous light of God's love. The church today is in, a, is in a challenging but hopeful time of discovering new ways to live out our calling in the world. This reality raises some important questions for Blenville to think through. Here are just a couple questions. Who is in pain and need around us as a church? Who is reaching out to Blenville for guidance and support? How can our church reach out to others in new ways? How can we share with them the good news of God's grace? Now, once we know who we are, how do we live out of this identity? Well, here's the best way to do that. To live out this identity, you need to learn how to meditate on the life of Christ and how he lived life. I have a book right here, and it's by Thomas Akempis, and it's entitled The Imitation of Christ. Now, Thomas Akempis, he was a leader of a spiritual movement in the 14th century, a medieval period of the church. Uh, to say that it was a dark time in that period is an understatement. But to help Christians get through such bleak times, Thomas Akempis wrote this book, The Imitation of Christ, and it's based off of the meditations that he had on the life of Christ in the Gospels. I want you to listen to how the book opens with John chapter 8, verse 12. Here's what it says. He who follows me walks not in darkness, says the Lord. And Thomas Akempis ponders that thought, and then here's what he writes. By these words of Christ, we are advised to imitate his life and habits, if we wish to be truly enlightened and free from all blindness of heart, let our chief effort, therefore, be to study the life of Christ. And then he concludes this. The teaching of Christ is more excellent than all the advice of the saints, and he who has his spirit will find in it a hidden manna, 
uh, bread from heaven. Now, there are many who hear the gospel often, but care little for it because they have not the spirit of Christ. Yet whoever wishes to understand fully the words of Christ must try to pattern his whole life on that of Christ. He's right, you know. Our identity, our purpose, and action, it should be driven by what we see Jesus do in the Gospels. So here's this week's exercise to help you experiment with living in the presence of God. It is to spend time daily meditating on the life of Christ. You can do this in an easy way. Step one is this. Choose a gospel to read. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Choose a gospel to read. And then the second step is this. Begin reading small portions of that gospel each day. And by small, I literally mean eight to ten verses at a time. You see, the goal of meditative reading of the Gospels is not to get through the book quickly. The goal is to walk through it slowly so that you have time to chew on the text, so you have time to experience what Jesus is doing in the text. And here's how you do that. As you read those 8 to 10 verses, in fact, read them multiple times, but then after reading it, come before God and say, God, what are you, what are you drawing my attention to? in what Jesus is doing here. And as you wait on him, you wait for him to answer that question. You wait for him to speak to you. Now, here's something I need, to, need you to understand. When I practice this, I have never once heard the audible voice of God. But I can tell you this. When I meditate on the Gospels and I ask that question, God, what are you drawing my attention to here? God does prompt me. And so find what it is that God prompts you with in the story. Is it the way Jesus speaks? Is it a truth that he shares? Is it an action that he does? What does Jesus do that prompts your heart to be drawn to it? And then the second thing is to ask this question. Ask God why. Why are you drawing my attention to this aspect of Jesus' life? Oftentimes when I ask that question, I'm often drawn to a specific aspect of the text because maybe that quality is missing in me. Or maybe it's something, uh, maybe it's an act that I'm just not very familiar with. It's an aspect of Jesus' life that I need to learn more about. But you ask Jesus, why do you want me to be aware of this aspect of Jesus' life? And that leads to step three. After reading the passage, after waiting for God to draw your attention to something in the text, next, brainstorm one way, even a small way, that you can apply Jesus' example to your own life. And then in your journal or your notebook, write down what you learned. That is basically the approach that Thomas Akempis used in the, in the book, The Imitation of Christ. Will you experiment with meditating on the life of Christ in the Gospels this week? This sermon has a simple conclusion that comes right out of 1 Peter. Here it is. Who are we, church? We are God's people, a community called together by God. Where are we? Well, we're called out of the darkness of this world into the grace of God's marvelous light. And then finally, why are we here, Blenville? To practice the life of Jesus as we reach out to love and bless people around us the way Jesus, our exemplar, did. Do you know who you are, Christian? Remembering the answer will guide us and keep us faithful in these challenging times.